complexity of the system is is doomed to be simpler than the system it's trying to be. Yes, is that's one way of thinking about it. Sure, sure. Well, you yeah, you could think about it as that's right. You can think about it as a limitation of the perceiver. The problem too is that whatever knowledge you accrue about the system changes the system. It's like trying to predict the stock market, which isn't possible, right? So I, th I think that's a really good example, actually. And you know, try to predict the stock market rationally. See how you do. Well, you might say, well, it's not real. It's like, okay, well, we don't agree about what constitutes real. So we could have that discussion. It sounds like what you're saying is that truth is as much about action as it is about some sort of material, measurable, objective reality. No, I'm saying it's more about action. More about Oh, yes, yes. The f fundamentals of truth are, are those that guide action. And then the objective science is nested inside that. It has to be. Right. There's no way around that. Okay, so that, that, that I think is really central because everything, in my mind, everything in Maps of Meaning and a lot of your other work flows from there. Mm -hmm. It's a different... Way, it's a different yeah, yeah. Priority. Oh, that's right. You, so maybe, that's right. Maybe we can elaborate that a little bit. Like, okay. Well, let, we can do that Darwinian. Let's do it from a Darwinian perspective. Okay. Okay. So, first of all, there's the single-cell animals. We'll say. Well, we don't have to talk about them. What what we're going to start to talk about is animals that have a complex, a sufficiently complex nervous system to have to respond to the social environment, which would be made out of conspecifics often. So lobsters are a perfectly good place to start. It's like once lobster, there's a lobster and then there's another lobster and maybe they're alone. Well, then they only have to solve the problem of being one lobster. But then as soon as you put them together, they have to solve the problem of being two lobsters in the same space. And then maybe there's a hundred lobsters in the same space. So then the question becomes, how do you organize lobster behavior when most of the environment consists of other lobsters behaving? And the answer to that is being you put it, you make a dominance hierarchy. And then the dominance hierarchy, the way you adapt to the dominance hierarchy is by noting the patterns of behavior that compose it and by um, first internalizing those, let's say, modeling them to the degree that that's possible, but even more remarkably, over huge expanses of time, because the dominance hierarchy and its patterns are a fundamental element of reality, you start to adapt biologically to the dominance hierarchy. So, okay, so now what we've got is we've got an emergent set of, of social behaviors. Okay, they're not rules, because they're not rules till you observe them or till you codify them, or till you articulate them. What they are is the patterns from which rules emerge. And they're deep patterns. So then you might say, okay, what are the rules for staying alive in a dominance hierarchy, not being torn apart by your conspecifics, and that's learning quickly who can tear you into pieces and who can't, and learning how to get away from the thing that can tear you into pieces quickly, and learning how to push the thing that can't aside. And you better learn that fast. And you want to learn it with the minimum possible amount of damage. Because that's another problem that social creatures have, or at least creatures that are in a dominance hierarchy. It gets even more complicated when the members of the dominance hierarchy start to cooperate. But lobsters, as far as we know, as far as I know, don't cooperate. So, but still, like their behavior is very, very determined by the nature of the dominance hierarchy. Okay, so what that is, the patterns that govern a dominance hierarchy are the place from which ethics derive. Right, and they evolved, they're, and they're not arbitrary. That's the other thing. What works in one dominance hierarchy works in another. And so you might say, well, what's your proof for that? And I would say, well, one of my proofs for that is that we use the same brain chemical and the same neurological system roughly speaking, to keep track of our position in the dominance hierarchy as lobsters do. And that's 300 million years of continuity. So, so that's real enough as far as I'm concerned. So, okay, so now you've got your lobsters and fine, they, they organize themselves according to these rules and the top lobster is confident and makes himself big and he's the one that gets all the chicks. 
So, so your success in the dominance hierarchy, especially if you're male, also determines the probability of your reproduction. And it may determine that more than anything else. So how to maneuver in the do dominance hierarchy might be the prime question that faces creatures that have to live with conspecifics. And the females, in some sense, use the dominance hierarchy as a distributed computational device to determine the worth of the males. So, because what the females do is they sort of hang off to the side and they watch the males battle it out and then they just pick from the top. Now, they have their own hierarchy and, you know, it, it runs by somewhat different rules, but it's very smart. It's, it's, they're externalizing the cognitive problem to the structure itself. So, okay, so, so then there's the rules that govern the dominance hierarchy, the simple one, which is just where they're the same animals, but they're competing. But then when you get a little farther along, you know, maybe to the point where animals are hunting together, that might be it, or, or caretaking, something like that anyways, where cooperative behavior emerges. Okay, now a di different rules start to apply. Because, like in a wolf pack, let's say, the wolf still wants to get to the top, but he doesn't want to tear everyone to pieces as he climbs to the top, because if he did that, then he won't be in a pack, and then that, that's not going to work. He's going to starve to death. So that really gets complicated. It's like you can defeat someone, but you can't destroy them. Okay, there's another moral rule. You can defeat someone, but you can't destroy them. So you might say, well, that's a rule that emerges spontaneously as a consequence of social interactions under biological control. And once the rule emerges, the dominance hierarchy lasts long enough so evolutionary pressure can start to operate to ensure that creatures within that system build their ability to follow that rule into their nervous systems. Because it's the main selection force, whether they're successful at it. So what seems to be arbitrary and social can become built in and biological, I think, faster than we understand, because the consequences of being victorious in the dominance hierarchy are so Hi. So, in the wolf hierarchy, it's sort of like, we got to hunt together, we're going to have disputes about who's boss. We'll settle the disputes symbolically, fundamentally, right? I'll threaten you, you threaten me, one of us will blink, the guy that blinks rolls over, throws, shows his throat, you pretend to rip it out, but you don't, and we accept that as a proxy for battle. Just so, to be clear, you're, you're making the case that wolves operate symbolically. No, not at all. It's just co this, that's, it's coded in their behavior. Yeah, yeah. You have to make a real distinction between patterns of action and rules. They're not the same thing. Because we like to think that, well, if you see regularities in an animal's behavior, it's following rules. No, it's as if it's following rules. Right, that's an, an, an anthropomorphic. Anthropomorphizing assumption. Basically. Well, it's it's also a different it's also a different it's a level of abstraction above. First, it's the the pattern of behavior. Then, if you observe the pattern of behavior and you have the capacity to make symbolic representations, then you can make the symbolic representation. And those would emerge first in image, not in words. Image, image and stories, right? So that's like the dramatic substrates behavior. And then it's behavior imitating behavior. That's drama. That's like a Piagetian idea, you know, that you can use your body as a representational structure. That's what human beings can do. That's what imitation is. It's a big deal. So, okay, so you got the wolves, and it's sort of like... Good. And, and so far, this is great so far. It sounds like the argument is building from lobsters to... Um, and this, this, is, this is how I'm interpreting it. From lobsters to uh, a strong argument for essentially why Jungian archetypes actually Absolutely. as things, which is yes, well, this very is, important. This is, However, mm -hmm. what I think what's also important is to help pe help viewers understand how we get from lobsters and dominance hierarchies mm -hmm. to no problem. truth. Okay, so they're not things. They're constituent elements of, rea of reality. That's not the same thing, okay? And, and a constituent element of reality is in some sense, depends on the thing, but it's its longevity is sufficient to make it more than merely a thing. Things are kind of temporary. I mean, protons aren't, but you know, things are temporary. Dominance hierarchies, those are not temporary. Those are eternal. They're eternal.
as far as we're concerned. No, okay, so you got...